It is good evening over here. It's good morning over there. Uh, Ryan, I first heard about you or read your work about three or four years ago after going on the Unslaved podcast. Yeah, Um, yeah, and I bought the book and uh, blown away by the level of depth and very esoteric book at the time. Uh, Back then it was in my own development. It was quite heavy, heavy going and I need to read it again a couple of years later when I was a bit more along the path to actually get more out of it. Um, what made you write Sun King? Okay, so yeah, Sun King. Uh, that's a good question. You know, okay, so a little a little context. Um, first of all, thanks for having me on. I, I really appreciate it. Thanks for reaching out to me, and thanks for thanks for looking at my book. I, you know, my work. Yeah. I never set out to be a writer, and uh, in all honesty, I I don't consider myself. Uh, so much of a writer. Um, It was just the way that my life unfolded really drove me into uh, a spiritual, you know, a deep looking into myself um, from a young age due to all kinds of things, mostly, mostly trauma that I realized later in my life triggered that. So I had to write things down just as a way to, uh, organize my thoughts and also to try to make sense of some experiences that I was having throughout my young life. So Sun King is my second book. And, um, once I wrote my first book, it was so arduous that I really, um, I didn't enjoy the process too much, but I enjoyed the fruits of my labor. I enjoyed having the document. Um, I think I'll look back on it and be, you know, someday in my life, be really happy with it, uh, that I did it. But to try to get to your question, I had no intention of writing another book, but I, uh, with the use of the internet, I, you know, used it to really dig deep into finding, try to find answers to some questions that my culture and my world really wasn't addressing, at least not my direct world. And I started diving deep into books. I read a lot. There was like seven years of my life, my young life, where like I didn't, I didn't stop reading. I just picked one book after another. And a lot of these books impacted my life. And then the internet was kind of like, like a, a digital library. And I really, really uh, am not super into tech and I'm not super tech savvy. And so the internet was a struggle for me. It still is. But I realized there is a lot of information that I can access pretty fast. So anyway, I started to look into the Western magical tradition, I guess you'd call it that, or just the Western, the Western philosophies, which I was not, that wasn't really brought to me in school. It wasn't brought to me by by my culture. Nobody in my immediate life were speaking of, of, uh, philosophers of, of, you know, great philosophers of the West. So when I started to tip into them, I started to realize, whoa, you know, there's a lot here, a lot here. And so I started, you know, when I read the Hermetica uh, or or just the condensed version, when I read um, Giordano Bruno's work, like no one told me about Giordano Bruno. You know, I I stumbled upon his work. um, And so there's a lot, a lot there. And anyway, I started to just, my mind works in a, in I guess it's intuitive, creative, psychic sort of uh, syncretic way, I started to see all the similarities between all these books that I was reading, all these different viewpoints. And I'd all also already read a lot of Eastern philosophy. And so I started to see the connection between the East and the West. And then, uh, and then believe it or not, I got inspired by the Da Vinci Code, um, mm. which I know is a fictional book, you know, but there were just some concepts in there that I hadn't heard before, like the, the idea of phi, you know, the number, the number thing, the harmonics of nature. So that cracked open for me a lot of very, really interesting things to look at. And, um, and then once I, once I realized that there was something here for me personally, I was like, I am, I'm going to develop through this process. I could tell that I was growing. It became an obsession and I started to write down all these concepts little bits and pieces. And as I wrote them down, I started to connect them. And I started to see all these 
I had these, you know, I had these aha moments. I had these epiphanies. And it also gave me a lot of clarity as to what was going on with me, what was going on in, in my spiritual life. So anyway, I know that's kind of a long winded answer, but when I wrote Sun King, which I do think is my, my best work. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know parts of it, you know, I've gotten a lot of good, good praise for that book, but I've also gotten a lot of my writing style, maybe a little bit, um, it, it could use refinement for sure. But for me, I was just trying to get the concepts out. You know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not focused so much on being a great writer, but, um, so when I wrote that book, I decided to write the entire book based on m um, mathematical harmonics of nature. So, mm -hmm. so there's a story in that book, there's information in that book, but the book itself is actually written on the way the sun moves through the, the galaxy and the way that our planets move being spit, spit out from the sun and the way that they move in, in a, basically in a, the harmonics of phi, pi and phi. So the book itself mm -hmm. is actually a document of phi. Um, although you would never know that if I didn't tell you all the way down to the amount of, uh, characters that are written in the book, meaning, uh, like letters, letters, symbols, numbers, yeah, yeah. The, you know, mm -hmm. so the whole book is just built as a, a tribute to nature, um, uh, for me, nice. you know? Okay. Mm. Nice. So why did you call it Sun King or, or why? I know, obviously, I know the gods and, and the sun cults and, and everything throughout history. Why in particular have you focused on the sun there? Yeah. So, okay. So through, through looking at the Western magical tradition, that's what tipped me off to looking into symbols and trying to become symbol literate. And then, and then as you look into symbols, you, you start to inevitably look into uh, n numbers. And as you look into numbers, you start to look into letters. And then I, you know, it's a, it's a deep dive, the esoteric mm -hmm. stru structure of, of our alphabet, the way that the symbols come to be what they are, why number one looks like it does, why number three looks like it does. Um, and their deep esoteric meanings, how this, these whole processes came about, uh, and so I focused on the sun because ultimately, if you're trying to look into life itself uh, from a theological perspective, which is what I was doing, I was trying to understand, well, what is the nature of God? Uh, yeah. w w what is God? What is the nature of, of our universe? How did we get here? Those big, those big existential questions, you inevitably, if you want to try to put something so big into a symbol, you're going to come to the sun. Um, yeah. and the sun obviously powers everything. I mean, there's, I can't find something that the sun doesn't power, you know, from plants and animals to back to bacteria to obviously the way our bodies are built. So, um, so to make it short, to try to simplify that answer, you know, our body is, uh, is built on a harmonic of the sun. The physical structure is built on a harmonic of, of the sun. And so if the physical structure is that way, then probably our mental structures are built on these harmonics mm -hmm. and, and our psychic structures. And so this concept of, of as above, so below, this hermetic concept, really, uh, really gave me a foundation to start to look at all things through these basic lenses and the hermetica talks about those seven hermetic principles and you don't have to look at the world through them but if you do you start to see that they pretty much apply to anything the way that things grow the way that things move the way that cells divide um so i just thought that uh that the human body is a reflection of the sun and i you know it you know a little side note that's that's why we call a baby boy a son. Mm. You know, it's it's a it is a, a reflection of the sun. You know, at least the and the and the sun tends to be male, tends to be masculine in in most ancient cultures. So, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm I'm big into Michael Tazarian's work, and he talks a lot about light and false light, Gnosticism. And, and like the Luciferic type light, 
in the world today, we see a lot of, um, how could we say, gurus, I use that term lightly, on stage and everything that uh, wrap elements of truth with absolute rubbish. Do you do you <laughs> consider uh, do you consider like what Michael Tazarian talks about, where he says like uh, these this is like false light, and how do you see the sun as a symbol in that context? Yeah, I do. I do. I tend to agree with Michael's work. By the way, I always I always give Michael a shout out if if I if the opportunity comes up because he's influenced yeah. me in a big way. Um, and obviously, I've been on Unslaved, which was um, a very meaningful step for me. I felt like when David Whitehead and Michael Tessarian interviewed me, I felt like, wow, I made it. I was like, I can't believe it. You know, <laughs> I'm like, yeah. not not made it. You know, obviously, it's not a financial success or anything like that. But um, I just admire Michael's work, and I admire David's work. I've actually met David in person, and uh, he's, you know, he he's just as a good of a human being as you might expect if you were to yeah. try to figure out what he was like. He's really, really a solid person. So um, Michael has this type of mind, you know, where he can seem to remember everything he's ever read, <laughs> you know, and he's, he's, he's able to pull out uh, information when it's applicable. And I admire that. And I've heard him, I've heard him go off on talks and he just, his ability to articulate these very hard to articulate subjects, I admire. So um, I do agree with Michael. He's he's got a great a, a great command of uh, the English language and describing psychological concepts, philosophical concepts, and these even these magical or mystical concepts. And so mm-hmm. um, I do agree with him that uh, there's certain principles. You know, I I agree that 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 you you can't have you can't have anything we can't perceive anything without its sort of dark shadow so when you look at an object any object mm. the only reason why why you're able to see it or know it's there is is yes because it's it's made of light but and light is hitting it but you would never know that light is hitting it if it wasn't casting a shadow and so it's the uh, it's like the negative in a photograph. You know, it the photograph won't exist without its negative, and um, light power. You know, ev- to me, everything is is light, and that energy just somehow, in order to manifest in a in a uh, in a three D type world, it has to have its darkness with it. And this is the you know the Taoist yin and yang. Like it's it's the the paradox of of being is that there's always going to be a, a a Hegelian dialectic. Yeah. You know, there's always going to be a yin and a yang, an up and a down, a light and a dark, a male and a female, a magnet, a magnetic and electric. Um, it, you're never going to find anything, at least in this world, that doesn't have its balancing counterpart. And yeah. you know, I guess I guess you could say that. Well, this is this is a tough one. You know, is is evil the shadow of good? Are they are they forever? You know, interconnected, um, like all other things, or is is goodness something totally separate from evil? I mean, yeah. But I do think that uh, I do think that there's no way of getting around it for your spiritual development your psychic development, your personal development, like you're never going to, you're never going to grow without going into the darkness, the dark parts of yourself. So the, yeah, the Luciferian doctrine, um, to me is like, is like the shadow side of things. And of course people abuse it. The people, I don't know any person, anybody personally that believes in, in the dark side of things, but of course you see it all out there. It's in our culture. Yeah. Yeah. It's on TV. There's so much subversiveness, and we, I, th- I think a lot of us see it. A lot of us just go, "Oh, okay, I'll still watch this, even though I know the programming involved is, let's say, let's say bad for me, bad for my mm-hmm. psychology. I'll still watch it, you know, this sadistic show or whatever it is." Um, yeah. And I think I think people abuse that that 
that side of it. They like to, they like to, uh, they're, sadi- they're actually sadistic. That's what it is. Like there's, there's, yeah, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. but as we see in culture today, is, isn't that just a manifested ego itself, a collective ego that's just playing itself out anyway? Yes. Yes. And you yeah, know, that. Go on, buddy. Sorry. Well, I was just going to kind of bring up your work. I just became familiar with you just recently. And I, you know, I've only, only briefly touched on your, your website and your work mm. and your, your YouTube channel, which by the way, I really, so far I really align with it. I think you do a great job and uh, there's a lot of similar you. things in your welcome. There's a lot of similar things in your, what little tiny bit of your story that I've read that is very similar to me. Um, at least in your early life, like I was a, I was a soccer player as well. Oh, I was nice. an athlete and my whole identity, everything I'd ever done was, was wrapped around that. And that was what I was going to do in my mind. I was going to be, I was going to play soccer for, for my whole life, you know? And, uh, much like you, my career was sort of ended abruptly. Mine was due to s- severe injury. Um, but it, it crushed me, you know, it crushed my ego. It crushed my identity. And uh, it actually is what propelled me in this to- total, uh, total other direction. And I started to uh, develop myself, you know, my soul, myself, um, out of really out of necessity. It, it was, you know, like I look back and I go, why did I go down this particular path? That I think it's, I think it's also a little bit of an obscure path. I mean, at least my my family and friends have always kind of been like, what you know, you're you're. Uh, I don't want to say, what's the word like. They've never condemned me for going the way that I've went, but they're always like scratching their head, like, why, why are you going? Why are you reading that? Why are you interested in that? What's what's made you go down that particular sort of odd path? And and uh, it wasn't really out of choice, although I do have I, I do have the predilections to do it. It was really out of necessity. It was a it was a survival thing, and um, I read briefly a little bit about your story, you know, mm-hmm. so I can relate. I can relate at least you know, to some of what, what you've been through and, um, mm. and yeah, that sort of thing. What, what degree do you think suffering plays in enlightenment? Yeah, I, th- I think it's, it's, a, it's a, to a big degree. I think that, you know, the, the Eastern traditions talk about, you know, life is suffering, the, the Buddhist traditions and not to be pessimistic and they're not trying to be pessimistic, uh, once you understand no. that. Um, what they're really doing, you know, I admire them is that they're just trying to keep it real. You know, they're just, they're just trying not to live in, um, in the, uh, what is it? The, the pseudo self, you know, the false self or the image of the self. They're trying to really stick to what they see. And it's like, okay, life has a great deal of struggle in it. Life has a great deal of pain in it. Life has a great deal of suffering in it. And I look, it's it's taken me a really long time because I've lived with chronic pain for as long as I can remember my entire life. Like since I was a young, young, young child, I've had chronic pain and, uh, it's, it's really been a blessing and a curse at the same time, you know, um, and it's driven me to where to, to into all these really beautiful places that I've explored in myself and it's helped me grow. And I look at suffering a lot like pain. They're kind of like archetypes. They're mm-hmm. things that ex- exist in the universe. They, they exist for all creatures as far as I can tell. And um, they, they drive us to grow. You know, um, I think human beings can be pretty lazy without some sort of motivation, some sort of impetus and, uh, suffering or the avoidance of it or mitigating it, uh, you know, or pain, they really teach us, um, to go, to, to go in a certain direction. You know, when you, when you hurt, you don't really want to hurt again. So you try to, you try to learn from what, what caused the pain and, and avoid it. You know, we have this avoidance thing. But, um, Mm. so yeah, as far Mm. as enlightenment, which, you know, to me, enlightenment is, uh, is really just an expansion of your awareness, you know, to me, that's what it is. So if your, your awareness is going to expand, you have to know 
and understand uh, everything about your environment that you're in. And suffering, pain and suffering is, is one of the key elements that you're not going to get away with it without. It's in your environment. It's always yeah. going to be there. And so, yeah, it, it plays a big role. It's a big, big yeah. role in enlightenment. Mm. Now you've moved into more, you know, for, for most of your life now, I'm supposing it's towards the Western magical tradition and, you know, hermeticism, that sort of thing. Do you tend to look at Eastern doctrine anymore or do you tend to park that now? I have parked it quite a bit for a long, for a long time now. Um, not because it's not valuable, but because, uh, mm. I feel like I've kind of, well, I don't want to say exhausted it, but you, you know, you read, read one Buddhist and you read another and you read one Taoist and you read another and you read one Hindu and you, and, you know, you read another, and you start to realize, okay, I got it. I got the idea. I got the story. Um, I pretty much have an understanding of what their philosophical underpinnings are. Yeah. So when I read another one, it uh, typically doesn't bring me something that I haven't experienced before. So, so uh, it's not that I'm opposed to it. It's just um, I want something that's going to expand me further. Mm. And sometimes it's just language. You know, it's just the way in which it's written, the way in which it's spoken, then I'm like, okay, I've already heard this, this uh, type of language. I've already heard this particular narrative I, I want. Yes. And, you know, I have, I have gone down, I've read a lot of different theological and spiritual and philosophical uh, traditions trying to figure out, you know, which one is the best, right? Which <laughs> one is the best? And, and, uh, as I've gone through life, I find that the one that is going to be best for each person, it's going to be unique to, to them. It's going to be unique to their, their predilections, their, their personality, as well as their experiences, also their culture, you know, what, how they're brought up. Um, but to try to answer your question, what's, what's helped me the most is action oriented things. So, let me see if I can explain this. I naturally prayed as a child. I, I naturally had yeah. a connection with God, with something spiritual. And this wasn't taught to me by my by my parents. I didn't go to church. My, my parents didn't, didn't take me to church. Um, so I already had this open part of myself. I believe all of us do. I believe all children have this, you know, it's a, it's a divine, it's a divine connection. And, um, and, I found that it took me a long time. I found that things that really worked for me were action oriented, where what I mean is like, um, it's, it's one thing to read, uh, about a tradition, a philosophical tradition or a spiritual path. But at some point in your life, you have to walk it. Like you have to go do it. You have to, you have to find it or you have to create it. You have to make it. And mm. the thing that's really helped me sort of become at ease with my particular path, which is a blend, you know, I, 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 I don't really uh, uh, subscribe to just one particular single path, but, but I, I draw from multiple traditions. And the thing that's really helped me is actually putting my physical body into those situations and experiencing them in action. So like, for example, I have, I have had a big shift in my personal path by going through Lakota ceremony or native American ceremony. And I think as a child, I needed that phys that, uh, that action oriented stuff, but I wasn't, mm. it wasn't, I didn't have access to it. So my parents didn't promote it. You know, my parents didn't take me to church. They'd never been to a ceremony. Um, you know, they didn't really even seem to have interest in this kind of thing, you know. And so I think as a child, I needed to ex to be in a place where I could express it physically and be present with it and, and experience it and walk through it. And, and so as an adult, I've sought out these type of experiences. And, and this is just for me personally, the native American tr tradition, um, 
and all traditions have their their good and bad, their yin and yang. They have their hypocrisies and their their brilliance. But the Native American tradition is, for me, was is really impactful because they really don't focus very much on the rhetoric. They don't focus very much on this on the the philosophy. They don't really talk about it much. They they act it out. Like they they put yeah, themselves yeah. into a, into a ceremony, and then when you're present, you witness what happens. You witness what occurs, and they really don't tend to even explain it. They don't tend to talk about it. And I mean, I, I imagine if you're in that tradition for years and years and years and years and years, as you move up, you know, and as you become more and more uh, committed, they reveal more and more yeah. of the path, and so. Hopefully that's not too long of an answer, but no, you know, good. it's like basically take action and figure it figure it out yourself along the way, I guess. Yeah, yeah, but but you can get lost, you know. Obviously, I, I kind of I just want to say this: like, I've been lost, I've been found, I've been lost, I, I've gone down a lot, I've gone down dead ends. I've I've, like you were talking about earlier, there's I've met quite a few people that consider themselves to be gurus. But uh, I find out they're they're the furthest thing from a guru. Matter of fact, they're they're more they have more dark in them than light. Um, their you know e- ego egos are huge. Um, yeah. You know I've met some some of these people that that wear the garb, uh, but they're certainly not walking the walk. You know, and if you if you spend enough time not listening to people that you say admire, respect, or think are are wonderful. But just paying attention to what they do, you know, paying yeah, attention. Yeah. If you have a teacher, if somebody's out there and you have a teacher and you're head over heels for your teacher and you think that they're they're a divine, they're like God incarnate and you need to just do everything they say. And that, trust me, there's people out. I'm sure there's people listening that have someone like that in their life. And I've been there. Yeah, yeah. I've been in that situation. I would just say, you know, don't just don't discard all the beautiful things about that person in that path. But, you know. They they still put their pants on one leg at a time. They they still stink, you know, if they don't shower. You know, they still make mistakes. They still abuse themselves and others. You know, they still make mistakes. Um, they're humans. You know, don't don't forget mm. that. Mm-hmm. Sure. One thing I'd I'd like to bring up with you is um initiation and and natural initiations that we go through as human beings not necessarily forced upon us by, you know, maybe like native Native Americans and everything, but initiations within us that happen organically and naturally over cycles. Do you believe that that happens, you know, like a, like a soul initiation every, say, seven or eight years? The hermetic tradition does talk about it in a numerical, like in, in a very orderly way, like, like, in these, like in these harmonics. Yeah. I would say that the answer is is a little bit uh, yes and no. I think that it does happen in an orderly pattern, just like just like a tree. You know, a tree grows in rings, a ram's mm. horn grows in rings. You know, a snail shell grows in rings. So we grow psychically in a, in an organized pattern, uh, or spiritually or emotionally. So there is this sort of nature will push us to. Um, to break free of that which we think we are every so often. So the answer is yes, I do believe that it that initiation happens that way. However, I believe it's it's the culture's responsibility and then of course the individual's responsibility to take to take their own life and and you know value it enough to to want to change, to want to grow, to want to expand, you know, and, and to help that process along. It's kind of like, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Right. So it's your responsibility to drink. Yeah. 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 I don't know any of your political side sidings or whatever. Are you, would you consider yourself like an individualist? Well, first, some context. I'm born in America, right? So I have that cultural lens to politic, mm. politic, politically look through. So, um, yeah, I believe first and foremost, I believe that you know, 
we are divine, sovereign individuals. So, mm. you know, no one, no one can get inside of my, my deepest thoughts and the things that are meaningful for me, except me. So no one can change those things except me. Yeah. So, so I believe in, in the sovereign self. I did a lecture series called the sovereign self lecture, lecture series, Gosh. which is another thing that you and I have in common, your site, you know, project sovereign. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, we have a lot of parallels there. So I, res I respect the work that you're doing. And, um, I personally think that all spiritual paths are trying to make the person indiv individually a whole, you know, what yeah. the Toltecs, the Toltecs would call total freedom, which is, you know, where you unlearn everything that you've ever learned uh, and become free of it. And then, of course, you're going to, as soon as that, the moment that that happens, you're going to start learning something new. And so this is like, it is a, an action oriented practice. Um, and then you spoke of initiation earlier too. Initiation mm. is this, is the same way. And, uh, I was watching one of your videos. I think, it, I think it is the one, how masculinity is being destroyed in our culture. Oh, and, yeah. You know, mm. you, you're real good at keeping things like, you know, six, seven minutes or whatever, like short and concise, but really nailing, nailing the, 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 uh, the topic there in a good way. I agree. You know, I, I'm aligned exactly with, with what you produced in that video. We've lost mm -hmm. our passed down initiations. Our culture doesn't do them anymore. Um, our rites of passage have, are like, um, you know, okay, you're 18, you can smoke pot now, you know, or you're 21, you can, <laughs> you know, it's like, you can go to the, you can go to the club and, um, shake your ass now. That's, that's our, that's the depth of our spiritual <laughs> initiations these days. And, and it's terrible because, uh, a young boy doesn't typically get taught how to become a young man and then become a wise elder. And then a young girl does not get taught, uh, what it is to be, um, you know, a divine and sacred vessel of life, a young woman, mm -hmm. and then a wise elder. And it's really how cultures you know, uh, get destroyed. It's just the breaking apart of those, mm. those traditional roles. So trying to wrap this back up into my political views. Mm -mm. Yeah, I'm an individualist for sure. And, um, but I'm also like a traditionalist, you know, I believe in the family unit as the bedrock of society. I do hold some American traditional values. I certainly, certainly believe in the first and second amendments, you know, as, as a, a very good political underpinning. I don't align with either party. Uh, personally, I think um, it's a bunch of political theater. A lot of it's meant yeah. for us to, to be to be distracted while, while they're all making deals in the back room to uh, push whatever um, financial and power alliances that they have. Um, and I know I, you know, I use that word, they, like, I was like, Oh God, you're a conspiracy theorist. You use the word they, <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, much of your videos are very good. If, if you, you know, if people can't see the social engineering that is going on right now, every single day with what we call the media, if you can't see that, that black mirror, the television tells lies to your vision, if you can't see that, you're just blue pilled, you know, you just, there'll, there'll come a day when it, it, uh, it, your reality gets shattered as well. And you, you know, you take the red pill and of course I'm using these colloquial matrix, you know, uh, uh, references, but, um, you know, we're going through some real big changes right now and they're being forced upon us. We're being, we're being forced to change. And, um, so, Politically, I do believe in being an individual and, and I can only control myself and my immediate environment. Mm. But if I was going to sort of try to express what what my political view is, I pretty much believe in and align with the United States Constitution. So I would call myself a constitutionalist. Yeah. Like I don't I don't I don't align with any party. I think they're just yeah. They're, they're full, they're all full of, full of feathering their own nests, you know, but mm. I believe that, um, that the United States is a great country. I think we're, we're, uh, 
we've got a lot of wonderful things. That's why millions and millions and millions and millions of people uh, have come here. My ancestors came here. Um, you know, I'm I'm the product of a couple generations, you know, immigrants, and uh, that's why most everybody wants to come here right now if they are given the opportunity. It's because we are uh, still a great nation. Um, I've been, I've traveled a lot. I've been to like 30 different countries, I think something like that. And I've seen a lot of different lifestyles and a lot of different cultures. And not to say that America is, you know, the best country in the world. And, and this, and we, we hold the ideals for every single other country. I believe each country is sovereign. They have the right to govern themselves. They have the right to make their own laws, uh, as they see fit because every country is unique and different. You're on an Island. You know, uh, you have different needs, you have different cultural, uh, things that are, you know, you're surrounded by water. I'm not. And so you're, you're in a small place. I'm in a big, big continental place. So, um, each nation it is actually a sovereign nation. And I think personally, I think it's moving despite what you see in the media. If you see what you see in the world, I think it's actually moving back towards a, um, a national a nationalism and a, a sovereignty movement in a, I mean, obviously not yeah. everywhere, but, but I have sources and I know people, you know, for years and years and years that are moving away from the one size fits all, the universalist, the globalist agenda where, right. you know, one group of people that's not even in your country, maybe they've never even been to your country are telling you how you should run your country. And I, I think yeah. that, uh, you know, you could we could go on and on and on for this. You could look into decentralized technology. De- you know what's going on right now in the world. Uh, there's like this weird. Both things are happening. You have this movement towards globalism, um, and then you have these these people within that movement that are breaking free of it and moving towards their own, trying to maintain their own rights, main to maintain their own privacy, maintain their own sovereignty maintain their own Hmm. um ability to make their own decisions for themselves their own laws for themselves like we just had uh i think it's going to be put on the ballot here just north you know up north of me five counties in in oregon are are trying to secede from the state of oregon and become uh, a part of the state of idaho and and uh, you know they have every right to go through that political process if enough people say you know these people over here in Portland or wherever their capital are making rules that we don't agree with as a, as a culture. Well, and this, this other nation, this other, you know, state right next door is making rules that we really do align with. They have every right to attempt to secede and be a part of, you know, the value system that they create. That's just sovereignty. That's every human being has their own, you know, they're their own sovereign, entity and i think nation states are just reflections of that and i think you know nations themselves are reflections of that yeah i agree yeah this one of the big problems we had over here in the uk was brexit i don't know how that was portrayed over in the states but that was a huge thing over here and you know you get labeled racist and all these shaming words if you if you backed it you know because the, the movement as you say is a more populist nationalist movement at the moment, the way consciousness seems to be operating anyway. And uh, the, the amount of hatred and unconscious just bile that comes out of people's mouths that's targeted towards you is just, well, it's amusing once you understand what's happening. But uh, to the average person, they're just, um, you know, it, it tends up at people at loggerheads because they're, they're both unconscious. They don't really know what's really going on. Um, but we've seen with the EU, like Greece are trying to open their borders for British people to to go over to Greece for the summer holidays because of COVID, whatever you believe about that. And <laughs> and Greece and Greece have said, yeah, come over. But the EU are trying to stop Greece from accepting people from Britain because we've come out of the EU. And it's like Greece just need to pull the plug and just tell the EU to fuck off. Yeah. But that they can't do it because they're in debt. They've just printed that much money. 
Yeah. Now they 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 owe money to the EU, so they're sort of in a trap. They can't get out of it, but they just need to default and just say we're out of here. But I, I doubt it's going to happen. They haven't got enough courage, I don't think. But I completely agree, man. I think the world's moving to a more nationalist um, ideology. I do. Yeah, you know, I I would say you're absolutely right as far as the way that Brexit was presented to the United States on the mainstream media was um, was not the way that I not the way that I followed it because I don't mm. I don't follow the mainstream media. I don't believe it. Actually, I have a degree in in film and media. Uh, that's what I did in college. And so I actually learned at how subversive it is because I was taught how to do it. I was taught how to create a narrative um, for whatever my yeah. particular agenda is. So, you know, I, I, uh, I actually respect Nigel Farage. You know, I think he did a great thing. Uh, I think it's amazing what he did. Uh, he did it in such a short amount of time, and I think it speaks volumes. And I also think that, uh, you know, the it's it's funny how governments can make decisions. Like it'll take three years to break away from for for even though the people have voted, it'll take three years to uh, to make that vote happen. Um, oh, it's so difficult to break away. It's so we got to do this and do that, and we're gonna have all these problems. And you know, <laughs> Theresa May would say, "Oh, it's gonna take all these years to to make Brexit a an official." But I mean, if there's something that they want to make happen, they can do it immediately. It's like mm. we, we, we can we can get on uh, fighter jets and and send aircraft carriers like right now to whatever nation state we want to conquer, and we'll be there in in minutes. And we'll make it happen. We'll take over. We'll, you know, we'll go to war for this. But it's always there's just so much hypocrisy in politics. And, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think you're going to see, uh, you know, I'm not uh, first of all, I'm not a political person, so I could be mm. totally wrong, wrong about this. But from my from what I see, I think you're going to see France. I think they're going to probably exit the EU. I think you're going to see Hungary, Poland. Uh, Czechoslovakia, yeah, yeah. Uh, Austria. You're going to see the Visegrad Four lead the way as far as uh, the the people's law, the the good the laws that the people should have as individual nation states. I think Viktor Orban in Poland or in uh, Hungary is uh, one of the smartest leaders in Europe yeah, right now. Yeah. yeah, and I think you're going to see you know Scotland. Well, you're in England, so you know a lot more about this than me. But I think Scotland, you know, is is also sort of moving towards independence. Um, I think Scotland, that, like, that, that, they've had the vote whether to stay with in the UK. They voted to stay in the UK a couple of times. And all they need to do is give the vote to the English and they'll be out. <laughs> They're doing it the wrong way around. <laughs> the wrong way, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 I, I, yeah. Completely agree. I completely agree. The EU is just a big bureaucratic entity that is just sucking the life out of the nation state and the sovereignty has just completely been uh, destroyed. And then you've got, uh, I've read this morning about there's been bombing Syria again and all that crap oh, that's going on. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and all that's doing is unsettling the Middle East again. Status quo is returning. We get mass immigration. As soon as uh, yeah. some of these people step into the EU, that's it, that they've got not residency but they can't just leave they can they just move around to the, the european union any nation that's in there and it just causes destabilization yep you've got sweden who's been like labeled the, the the most one of the most tolerant socialist countries i know people who live in sweden they're marching down the streets of stockholm to stop immigration it's yep. absolute nonsense what you hear oh yeah you know it's funny i uh i have a friend who's from finland actually but he he lived in Sweden, but back and forth for most of his life. And he he came to America year after year after year after year. And we he was doing it for he was practicing Native American ceremony. Uh, it was so impactful for him that he would fly over here for you know a couple months each summer and 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 do hardcore you know spiritual development through the the Native American way. And he was the first one who told me what was going on in Sweden. And this is well, you know. I don't know. This is about five years, maybe six years ago, and I was shocked mm -hmm. to hear what he what he had to say. And um, at first, I was like, "Really? Is all that going on?" And then he said, "Yeah, you know, here you know, people are people are writing articles about it, posting videos about it. It's all up there if you want to find it." And sure enough, you know, it it wasn't hard for me to find 
like what you're saying, people marching in the streets mm-hmm. right now, but you'll never get that on the mainstream media. And I, I would mm-hmm. share it with people. I even shared some of that stuff with my family. And they just were like, this can't be happening. This is the, this is denying, you know, they just denied it, denied it and denied it because I have family and I have family in Europe. And, uh, I'd say, Hey, you know, you're, you're not very far away from where this is happening. Um, but it's funny five years later, right now, all those family members that I shared these things with, they all know now that it, it, it was occurring and that it is occurring and that it did occur. But it's weird how, uh, when you bring something up that, people don't want to see and a lot of times they just uh whatever their beliefs belief systems are very strong you know we cling to them for safety and security but if you just kind of step back in your own life and think about what you believed when you were 10 years old what you believe when you're 20 years old what you believe when you're 30 you know i'm in my 40s uh, it's amazing at how what I thought was totally 100% absolutely true when I was 20, I clearly, <laughs> clearly now know, um, yeah, you know, it, it, I have a broader perspective. It wasn't quite yeah, yeah. accurate. And I think all of our belief systems, all of them, uh, you know, need to grow and expand and encompass more. And um, that process is it need, it's supposed to be taught. That's what wise elders are supposed yeah, yeah. to te- te- teach the younger generation is how to allow yourself to shed uh, the parts of your identity that you cling to so desperately that you actually no longer need. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. That goes into everything, politics, philosophy. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, Nietzsche, you know, Frederick Nietzsche so famously mm-hmm. destroys people's morality or let's say the, the the standard morality of the time that he was in he just destroys it like he, it's pretty hard to to yeah. dispute dispute his argument and the the cool thing he does is you know he says well a lot of people that would read read his you know beyond good and evil or something like that they're like well when is he going to tell me what morals i should follow when is, yeah, when yeah. is <laughs> he's he's destroyed my morals, my my family's morals, my culture's morals, my you know my philosophical underpinnings. Now I'm left with nothing. When is he going to tell me what is true? Well, mm-hmm. he really mm-hmm. he really you know he really doesn't. He says you know if there's the closest thing that he tells you that you could uh, pin your identity on to being true is to just constantly reevaluate what you think is true, constantly reevaluate your morals. And that is a, a never ending practice. And he's like, that's going to get you to be more centered than to cling to just one particular belief system, political or philosophical or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's humility as well. Just as Socrates said, knowing that you don't know anything that always leaves you in a space of like open-mindedness and you know, as you say, in 10 years' time, you're probably going to have a completely different worldview to what you've got today and be open to that change. Because most people don't develop, in my opinion, from my experience with other people, they don't develop to that point of open-mindedness, mm-hmm. which which should be the, the, the basis of all, in my opinion, knowledge is, is being completely open to being completely wrong. And, yeah, uh, yeah I, see, I see it, you know, all around me, my family is very similar. They're very, although they're better, they're very close-minded. I think this COVID scenario that we're in at the moment, they're, they're looking, they've been watching the news and whatever, and they're, now they're thinking, hang on, some of this information stinks. Yeah, oh, we've got man. It's, yeah, it's just ridiculous. But but I completely agree going back to that point, um, yeah, knowing that you know anything, nothing. And, but you've got people like Ken Wilbur and oh yeah, uh, Susan Cook-Greuter and things like that who've created these ego development models and once you're aware of them, you can sort of, without trying to put your ego all over it, you can sort of say, oh, right, I'm at that point. And, and you go, okay, that's where I'm going. If I stay on this uh, path of, of trajectory, without trying to make it a self-fulfilling prophecy, uh, you can sort of see where you're at, you know. And, and I'll find those models, Ken Wilbur, Spiral Dynamics, Susan cook Reuter, people like that, to be vastly helpful. But once again, it gets to the point where you need to drop that and go, 
they were great, but now I need to park them mm-hmm. and actually do me and find me mm-hmm. because I'm using it as a model just just to transcend it. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I'm mm-hmm. there. I need to get to there. You need to park that. But that's, I suppose, that's a, a level of development you need to get to. Yeah, and there's also pre- societal pressures too they, that we're, we're sort of taught all this cultural conditioning. Um, uh, you need to strive for this. You need to achieve that. You need to do this. And it's it's a tough one because um, you do need to have a purpose in life if you want to uh, have and cultivate energy. If you don't have a purpose, you tend to you tend to be lazy. You tend to sit around. You tend to like yeah. let you tend to let life happen to you. And so I believe yeah. it's a I believe it's a balance, right? You you don't want to strive. 24 seven so much that you, you do burn yourself out mentally and physically, especially if you're striving for something that does, it's not even really, um, aligned with your values, you know, but in the same sense, you don't want to just be so uh, nonchalant about life that you don't take life seriously and you don't take yourself your own. Cause you know, you're going to wake up one day, we're, we're all going to do this. And I, I'll go back to this. I think that going through suffering or having pain does teach you a bit about this. It teaches you that like, that even if you don't feel it right now, life is ultimately going to seem short. At some point you're going to, you're going to pass, you're going to pass away. You know, you're going to move on. And, um, what you don't want, I think this is just my value. I'm not trying to push it on other people, but in my, my way I see it is what you don't want is just to be, just to be in regret. You know, you don't want to be wishing, oh, I wish I would have done that. I wish I would have done this. What you want to do is to engage with life. And just just engaging with life is in itself life affirming. Just mm-hmm. engaging because you allow yourself to put yourself, you allow yourself to go through the places where you're uncomfortable. Instead of avoiding them, you actually engage with them. And just that alone, even if you're unsuccessful, even if you fail and then try again and just you move through it, you know, you, the, the fact that you're engaged with it forces growth. And um, it's a weird we're in a weird place where in our culture, you know, where the, the technology has been sold to us as the end all be all like the savior of things. And it's, it's also been sold to us to where we, where we get our values, where we get our identity. You know, the news media will tell you, uh, you know, you should think this about COVID. You should think that about politics. You should think this about religion. You should think that about, you know, um, all these other, um, current topics, you know, the whole Mm -hmm. thing, the entire, the entire medium of, of media, especially in the technological space, is itself a psychological operation. To me, the the, the news media, to quote Neil Kramer, um, mm-hmm. the me, the media is a psyop. The whole thing, yeah. the, the whole thing, it always has been. Even way back for thousands of years, you know, um, let's let's say political leaders or uh, leaders of empire have always spun a story to tell mm. the masses and yeah. and it do, it doesn't even matter what the story is it doesn't matter if it's a good story a bad story a true story or a false story all that they care about is that they control the story it's just we keep spinning the story so that no one else can control the story it, it doesn't mm. matter if it's good bad or indifferent they just want that power they want to control mm. the narrative whenever they need it Whenever they want to introduce something drastic to change culture, they're the ones that hold the, let's say, call it the the levers of power when it comes to the way a culture is supposed to think or a way a culture mm-hmm. is, is supposed to behave. And I mean, this is very ancient. This has been going on. That's why, mm-hmm. you know, again, back to, to Sarian's work, and there's a whole bunch of other people too. I know you you uh, mm-hmm. interviewed Eustace Mullins. I mean, not Eustace Mullins, mm-hmm. uh, Jordan um, Maxwell. Jordan Maxwell. You know, you've interviewed a lot of great people, uh, Ralph Ellis. That's another thing. When you look, when you start to read alternative historians, uh, you don't have to believe what the other historians have written. But what you do have to, you do have to go, oh, well, this person was alive. 
during or around this time when this event happened. So they have way more insight into it than I do thousand years later. So let's read what they said. They were around, they were there, you know, or supposedly they were there. Let's read what they said. Well, you start to read alternative historians about, you know, huge cultural events and you start to go, Ooh, this is not the way I was taught it in school. This is, this is a whole yeah. different, whole different perspective. And again, you don't necessarily have to believe it, but if you just think it through, a lot of these alternative historians have extremely valid trains of thought or, or logical, mm -hmm. they're like following the consequences and they, and it all makes a certain type of logical sense. So, Hey, maybe it is true, or maybe it's more true than what you've been told by your, your main, your mainstream media, your mainstream culture, your mainstream education, mm -hmm. you know, um, it just offers, I think it just opens people up and offers a different way of thinking, like a higher discernment. The ability mm -hmm. ability to see see things from two points of view at the same time, and and hold them both. Again, you don't have to necessarily pick one and go, oh, this is the right one. I'm I'm staking yeah. all my claim on this. But if you don't practice holding two views in in your mind at one time, you're just myopic, and you you're going to create a bubble. You're going to live in an echo chamber, and yeah. you know you're just not going to you're not going to grow the way that you are truly, I think, designed by nature, but you know, to grow. How much of an excuse is there now, though, Ryan, with the amount of technology and information that is available? Like, I, I'm a very average IQ and intelligent guy. There isn't, I'm not special at all. Yet, I've probably read at least probably 500 books in the last 10 years. And I've watched so many YouTube videos and whatever else all over the internet. What excuse is there now to be ignorant? Wow, <laughs> that's a good question. Well, there's 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 an infinite amount of excuses, right? Uh, to to mm. be ignorant, but I think some of the the reasons why they're happening, the 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 underpinnings of why they're happening, is just affluence. You know, there's a correlation between a very affluent society um, and its ability to innovate and move forward. Yeah, it's, sure. uh, I don't know if you've ever, I don't know if you've ever read J.D. Unwin. He's a British uh, right. sociologist and, and um, no, I an anthropologist. He wrote a book called Sex and Culture, you know, where he studied 5,000 different tribes over the course of, a, I don't know, 20 years or 30 years or something. And he, you know, compiled it all together and started to write what, what are the similar similarities I find with all cultures, regardless of where they're at geographically, what their skin color is, what they think of God or, you know, what, what are their, what are these, these things that they all have in common? And he goes through a lot. It's a, it's a really big study, but mm -hmm. you know, he talks about how um, when a culture no longer has a conscience, like they they let go of their moral values, become so loose, and I'll even use the word liberal. They become so yeah. liberal <laughs> with with their uh, their values that they no longer value them anymore, and they don't practice them anymore. And they say it's okay to do this, it's okay to do that. We're we're so we're new and we're hip. Um, they fall out of balance with nature and, and they fall out of balance also with the, the very traditional value system. And it's not that, that a value system that's traditional is all perfect and correct, but mm -hmm. there's a re there's a reason why it's traditional. It's because it's, it's tested the, it's lasted through the test of time. Yeah, it doesn't mean yeah. it doesn't mean you can't evolve your traditional value system, but you can't discard it. You can't act like it never happened, or you can't act like it didn't get you through fifty thousand years of human development. Mm -hmm. You have you have to kind of balance mm -hmm. that with the new one. So, um, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is, a lot of the excuses come when the family unit gets broken apart and 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 boys don't become men and girls don't become women. They never mature. Mm -hmm. 
like emotionally, spiritually. And so they don't know how to be a woman. They don't know how to be a man. And they don't know how precious the gift of life is. And they don't, let's say, seize the moment. They don't, they don't engage with life to their full potential. And, um, so they don't, they don't grow, you know, as people, as, as much as they could, as much as we all could. And, um, so then they develop victimhood mentalities and they develop excuses and don't get me wrong. Like I do this too. I'm not perfect or anything like that. But if you engage in a, if you engage in your own self-development, your own sovereignty, make up your own mind, not, not what your parents told you, not what your culture told you. Matter of fact, the whole process is to undo everything. Like we've talked about, unlearn everything and try to make room for awareness to bring in new awareness. If you engage in that process, you will, what will happen is on the fundamental level, you harvest more energy. You actually like, um, renew and recreate your own energy and it, it uh, amplifies exponentially and you become a more powerful person Mm. and and you when you're when you're when you're a powerful person and like i said i'm i'm working on this myself i'm not i'm not pontificating i'm not saying that i'm like i'm there i'm I'm not speaking from a soapbox but Mm. i understand i understand this process is when you when you when you become a certain power when you have a certain amount of energy harvested at your use and disposal for one thing you start to do is you start to be very efficient with your energy mm-hmm. and so you don't you don't waste it quite so much and then the other thing you do is uh your i'll just say this your language changes um you 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 start to see the um how do i say this the frivolity um Frivolousness. Yeah, like frivolous. Know. Frivolous. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You you start to see how frivolous victimhood speech is, and you mm. start to see how frivolous it is to um to frame your own self as if the world happened to you, as if as if uh you're you're a victim. Basically, it doesn't mean that mm. you haven't been you haven't been victimized somewhere in your life. Of course you have, but. But everyone has. There's not a person yeah, yeah. on earth that hasn't. None of us get out of here alive. So if you just speak in the in the terms of, of the victim all the time, then you are really, really limiting your power. And you're also giving it – you're wasting it and giving it away. And you're, you're going backwards. And I think that that's, that happens when cultures fall apart. And yeah. culture, cu- cultures fall apart when the family unit falls apart. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this, we can go all kinds of directions with it, go back into politics, you know, um, mm-hmm. which I'm not necessarily, we don't, not necessarily saying we should go there, but, you know, when you start mm-hmm. to look at the philosophies that underpin political views, you know, it, it's pretty obvious that the communistic, socialistic mm-hmm. uh, model is just, it's just Marx. It's just Marxism. You know, it's, yeah, yeah. you want to, if you want to make it simple, it's just Marxism. Uh, Mar- well, Marxism. People read Marx, they the don't look at who funded him. They don't <laughs> look at the, yeah, no, you know, it's like you only scratch the surface of these stuff and then, you know, the preach in the universities and everything and people come out there, children at 20, 21, no ego development. And, and then they take that into the forties and fifties and society doesn't evolve. Yeah, and then we've got now every every civilization rises and falls. That's to me that's a natural organic consciousness movement that 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 is going to happen forever. And I look at America now, and I think I look at it, and I think you're on your knees. Yeah, yeah. The last 50, 60 years or so, it's just yeah. And I, I revere America. I really do. I think you know the land of freedom and liberty. I know it's just words and everything, but. Look at the the technology that comes out of the U.S. and mm-hmm. the innovation that comes out of the U.S. Well, you know, freedom and liberty are are words of the non-victim. They're they're words yeah. that are uh, life affirming, right? So yeah, they're just words, um, and they build they build a certain culture, but they're good words. They're positive words. Yeah. They're affirming yeah. words. Mm-hmm. And you know, America's not perfect. No nation is perfect. No, no human's perfect, but 
America has done a lot of things um, for humanity that other nations have not. And, um, you know, you, you have to call it like it is. It's like America is this is a, one of the strong seats of innovation. It's also, you know, we've created um, civil rights for all groups of people. We, you know, I don't, yeah. I don't know if, you, you know, I think one in four of all refugees on the planet right now live in America. Wow. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've taken That's 25 percent of all refugees have come here to to attempt to start a better life because the opportunity exists, you know, here and it doesn't exist everywhere. There's some places it does, but it doesn't exist everywhere. And, mm. uh, you know, it's yeah, you know, one uh, back to Marx, you know, nobody looks at, like you said, who funded him. But they also most people don't look at, well, how did he live his life? You know, yeah. was he give, was he giving mm-hmm. away was he giving away all of his wealth equally to all of his readers, all of his followers? <laughs> no, I mean he was preaching one thing, and then doing another. You know, it's like yeah. there's yeah. a plenty of plenty of politicians that that's what they do. They're like, you know, here's some some laws for you, uh, but but I'm not going to follow them. Here's yeah, some sure. here's yeah. some rules for you guys. This is the way you have to you have to get paid and manage your wealth and here's the opportunities that you have, but not for me, you know? Mm-hmm. And so Marx is like that, you know, he didn't live, mm. he didn't practice what he preached. I think that's yeah, yeah. fair to say. And do you know, have you studied Helena Blavatsky? <sighs> yeah. Um, the veil of Isis, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, so, the secret doctrine, cause she considered the U S the next like root race of humanity you know she believed in like root races throughout time and mm-hmm. and she thinks that the next one is the us which is why it takes in so many refugees and mm-hmm. and there's such a mix going on that's why she th- she believed that was happening but that was obviously before the 20th century so perhaps she was ahead of her time because i don't think it was quite like that then was it you know, uh, I, I can't speak too much on Helena Blavatsky because I don't want to uh, speak about things I don't know. I mm. have I've only read small bits and pieces of um, I don't even remember which one. It was either The Veil of Isis or or The Secret Doctrine. You know, I've only read like a few chapters here and there pages and it's been a long time. The thing that I the way that I look at her and again, I, I could be totally wrong. I look mm. at her as a clairvoyant i think she had some insight uh and i think she she had some psychic ability and i think there's probably like where she where she started her writings from is probably a valid foundational place to start it uh i just think that also her work has been I don't know, suppressed. I think it's possibly been been changed and edited. I think it's also been yeah. um, co-opted for certain movements. Mm. I know I know that the um, you know, I look at it like this. Um, the theosophy movement, I think the theosophy movement is connected to her with her somehow. Um, yeah, she started it. Yeah. She started it. Okay. Well, mm. I look at these kind of things like uh, let's let's say you you go in full full bore on theosophy. Well, even though she started it, it doesn't mean that theosophy is is actually what Helena's values are. It things change over time. They they get they grow. And I look at like um, uh, Krishnamurti. You know, he started out in in there in the same groups of people, but he left, and he because he could see right away the the corruption of the thought. The, you know, the yeah. the the uh, the guru standing changing the actual message. So he left. It doesn't mean that you should associate Krishnamurti's philosophical points of view with theosophy just because yeah. he was a part of that movement. Um, and it's the same with Rudolf Steiner. You know, um, what's mm. his – He what was his um, anth- anthroposophy? Anthroposophy. So, mm. like, you, you could agree or disagree with the, the anthroposophical movement, uh, but – Go read Rudolf Steiner himself. You know, go read his yeah. work, not not the group's work. Read what came out of his mouth came came from his his pen to paper, 
and you'll have a different view. And yeah, so, uh, yeah. but so I know I'm kind of going off here, but from what little I know about Blavatsky is I, I think that her work has been, I don't know, subverted to some degree. Yeah, yeah. With, and it was heavily know. Christian at the time. So she was basically tearing Christianity apart. So there's obviously going to be yeah. some incongruencies there. And you, you know how it is. Christians don't burn books. So that's what they always say here. Christians don't burn books. Okay, whatever. <laughs> well, they uh, the largest you know library in the world is sitting underneath the Vatican, right? So they maybe they don't burn yeah. them, but they they certainly uh don't they certainly try to control the information. Yeah, yeah, mate. We've done over an hour. Just in closing, who has been your biggest influences? Well, it depends on what you mean, like uh, like public figures or or people that have just been extremely yeah, say public figures, yeah public figures well well public figures you mentioned like Giardino Bruno earlier yeah okay so I haven't read Bruno in a long time but mm. yeah he he's definitely influential in the to me the way that he thinks um and you know Michael Cesarian's work is awesome especially like stuff on alternative history the Irish origins um there's so many um I'm trying to think of what books I have lately. Um, you know, a big I got us. I've said this in a lot of my, a lot of talks. A big, big, big influence on me is Carlos Castaneda. Nice. And, and uh, you know, I think he's very much misunderstood because he writes in such a cryptic way. He's a genius. Yeah. He's definitely a genius, and um, he he is somehow able to encode uh, multiple layers of meaning in the word and in, in, mm. in the, in the book, in the text. And there's a surface level of meaning. There's another level of meaning. There's an even deeper level of meaning. And so for, he's been a big influence for me. Um, Paramahansa Yogananda has been a big influence mm. in me early on in my life when, when I was at a critical, critical stage in my life where I wasn't sure I was going to stick around, you know? Uh, right. mm. so that introduced me to the Hindu Hinduism and introduced me to the the Bhagavad Gita and Hindu cosmology. And, you know, I've also had, I've had quite a few experiences with, how do I say this? With that line of teaching in my, in my life where a lot of that, um, mm. you know, things do get lost in translation. I've actually spoken to, um, gosh, I'm, I'm sorry. His name is slipping me right now. Um, I know, I know you mean, I can't remember his name myself. But, yeah, I, yeah. I, I did an interview with him that, that was not recorded correctly. I really wish it would have right. been, um, but technologies, you know, for some reason it wasn't meant to be done, but, uh, yeah. you know, you know, the things get lost in translation. It is a very ancient story. I think there's, I think there's certainly, uh, some fundamental truths in it. Um, it's just really hard to pick through the, uh, the modern, the modern translation of it, you know, mm -hmm. but I, I, yeah, I mean, there's, I don't know. There's a lot of influences. Um, Goethe, yeah. you know, Rudolf Steiner, yeah, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. the light course, you know, if you want to learn about the scientific method and the scientific mind, um, read Rudolf Steiner and read, read Goethe, who, in my opinion, one of the greatest Sci let's call it scientist, philosopher, yeah. um, ever, you know, uh, mm. you know, there's a, uh, you know, I'm also, uh, I also noticed you and I have some of the same books. Um, I read Thomas H. Burgoyne, the light of Egypt. That's pretty profound. Yeah. Um, you have some stoicism back there. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've read some basics, uh, Marcus Aurelius. I don't think you can go wrong with those. Yeah. Yeah. Seneca, they, Marcus Aurelius does not really, that's a basis of stoicism done. You don't need to read much more, to be honest. You no, know, that's kind of the beauty of it. You know, it's yeah, it's all right there. You know. Yeah, I, I just I, I did catch some of your uh, presentations that you did on language on mm -hmm. YouTube. That's very good. I do recommend people going to that. I really enjoyed listening to those. Is there anything that you obviously you've got your book sunking? Is there anything you want to promote or anything? Yeah. Well, thank you. Um. 
You know, I'll just say that currently I'm working on a project right now with um, a gentleman named Michael Brand. He created a tool called The Offering, which deals with the power of language and the power of speech. Um, I won't go into it because it's it's too much to go into, but um, right Mm -hmm. now I'm just helping him with some word breakdowns and some esoteric meanings of some of the words that he uses. So I could promote people to go look at his work. It's, it's called uh, brand offerings, brandofferings.com. And then nice. for my, for myself, you know, um, I have a limited, limited amount of products out there, but I've written three books. Um, Sun King, I think is probably the, my best work. Um, I wrote one before that called tide and the Cranog which um it's all 100 percent true just just my spiritual development this things that i've been through and went through and tried to it's a it's a book of recapitulation it's a book of process and um you know it's it's just like things i think that are very human that like all human beings are going to go through at some point in their life so i think it relates to, to people in that way and then my third book um, not about me at all. It's about a gentleman named Lee Plenty Wolf. He's a 30-year Sundance chief from the Lakota, the Oglala Lakota, and um, he, you know, he's he's been influential to me in um, practicing spirituality, like living it, walking it, putting yeah. yourself yeah. putting yourself out there, getting getting your nose out of the book, and getting you know into the world. And th- mm-hmm. this book is about his life. It's called Plenty Wolf Medicine, and it's about it's you know people are interested in the Native American tradition. It's it's the Native American tradition you know intimately told from his his life, how he got to be a, a Sundance chief, and um, Wonderful. you know while I'm talking about that, I know I know we're short on time, but I just like to sort of you know let people know he's he's suffering right now. He um he he just had you know a big event happened to him. His, he had a, a massive heart attack and uh, just a couple of days ago. So, you know, we're just hoping he gets through it. Mm. We're sending blessings from over here, mate. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Right, Matt, I've really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you for coming on, Ryan. I, I really do appreciate it, mate. Yeah, me too. Hey, thanks for reaching out. And um, I'm going to, now that I'm connected to you, I'm, I'm also going to, you know, look more into your work. Uh, I think mm. what you're doing, I think what you're doing is awesome. It's excellent. You know, Thank it's, you. Thank it's you super, much. it's super professional and you've got a knack for uh, keeping it succinct. And so I appreciate, you know, just connecting with you and who knows, maybe we'll connect again in the future. Yeah. Thank you. All the best, Ryan. All right. Cheers. Bye.